Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Today I'll be talking a little bit about Noah Webster, the world he lived in, and the world that he helped shape over the course of his lifetime. Uh, I'll be previewing some items that will be on display as part of our annual Dictionary Day event here at the Beinecke, and they offer us a view of Webster's long and varied career, the um, ideology behind some of his work, and his ongoing influence on American language and culture. So who is Noah Webster? Noah Webster's life and his career are far too long and varied to fully cover here uh, in one slide, but I do wanna start with a sort of quick timeline of his life to help us get oriented. Webster was born in what is now West Hartford, Connecticut in 1758. He graduated from Yale in 1778 during the Revolutionary War. He was a teacher in Connecticut, also worked as a lawyer, um, and in the 1780s, he began publishing his Grammatical Institute of the English Language. Um, these were textbooks uh, teaching language skills to children um, that were commonly known as the blue-backed spellers and were some of the you know, most best-selling books of the, um, of the 19th century. In 1787, he attended the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, and he published an influential report on the convention. And it was also uh, during his time in Philadelphia for the convention that he met his future wife, Rebecca Greenleaf. He founded the American Minerva uh, newspaper in 1793, and that was New York's first daily newspaper. Today, he's primarily remembered for his contributions to language education and um, to, the, to American English as a sort of distinct segment of, of the English language. But he had interest and knowledge in a really wide variety of topics and was influential in a lot of different areas. He wrote about everything from American government and politics to Christian, Christian theology and epidemiology. He wrote his own version of the King James Bible. He advocated for copyright law. Um, he served in the Connecticut uh, State of uh, House, the Connecticut House of Representatives, um, and he was also a founder of Amherst Academy, which was a, um, the basis for Amherst College. The research that went into Webster's dictionaries was ongoing over decades of his life. He published in 1806 a compendious dictionary of the English language, which despite the, the title is actually uh, briefer than, than his later uh, dictionary. Um, pretty much as soon as he published that dictionary, he continued his research to put together a more comprehensive dictionary, publishing the um, American Dictionary of the English Language in 1828. Noah Webster died in 1843, and he's actually buried just across the street from the Beinecke Library in uh, Grove Street Cemetery, along with his wife, Rebecca, and um, several other family members. Much of Webster's life and work happened here in New Haven. He lived in New Haven uh, during the first years of the American Revolutionary War as a student here at Yale, and he returned to New Haven with his family in 1798. They lived uh, first in um, a home that had belonged to Benedict Arnold on what is now Water Street. That house is no longer there. Um, they left New Haven several years after that, but returned in 1822 and lived in a home uh, near the corner of Temple and Grove Streets. That house was to be demolished in the 1930s to make way for um, Silliman College on the Yale campus, but instead it was uh, rescued and moved to uh, Henry Ford's Greenfield Village, uh, historical village in Dearborn, Michigan um, at that time, and, and it's still there today. Much of Webster's work, including uh, his work on the 1828 dictionary, was done here in New Haven, and as we'll see, was very interconnected with his community here in New Haven and involved other New Haveners. Webster's life intersects with many transformative moments in United States history and in the history of New Haven as well. His work touches on many significant issues of his day. Dictionary Day is an annual event marking Noah Webster's birthday, which is October 16th. 
and recognizing his contributions to American language and culture. Beinecke commemorates Dictionary Day each year in partnership with our friends at the New Haven Museum with an open house event where people can explore primary source materials documenting Noah Webster, the Webster family, New Haven during their time, uh, and the lives of, of people connected with Noah Webster as well as sort of more broadly, the history of language education and dictionaries, um, both in English and in other languages. We see Noah Webster as an entry point to a wide array of topics um, in 18th and 19th century history. And we hope that everyone who comes to our Dictionary Day events comes away having learned something new. And today I'll just highlight a few of the items that are on display as part of our Dictionary Day open house this year. Webster was very much involved in shaping the United States in its early years. He wrote extensively on government and politics and was closely connected with many early political leaders. This is a, a newspaper um, called the Freeman's Chronicle, in which he published the series Observations on the Revolution in America in 1783. And it was published over, this, over the course of several issues of this newspaper, which was actually, as you can see in the, the note at the top here, um, he notes was published by his cousin. The series reflects his optimism about the young country, his uh, hopes, for the United States and its system of government, and broadly reflects his worldview at the time. One thing that makes this newspaper, and is one reason that we include it in the Dictionary Day uh, display each year, is that he went back and added notations or annotations to the newspaper later. These annotations show in some ways how his thinking and views evolved over the course of his life. And that he didn't see some of his high hopes for the United States coming true uh, as, as time went on. You see the note at the bottom here. Um, this is at the bottom of one of his columns. He writes, these remarks show my feelings and views in 1783, very inaccurate indeed. And the image at top is a, a section of the series where he argues that, um, and this is a quote, sensible of the incessant progress of all human institutions towards corruption and the tendency of all governments to tyranny. America has been careful in the infancy of her independence to guard against the accumulation of power either by particular states or by individuals and making merit and not wealth or hereditary titles the sole rule of promotion. He um, predicts here that the American system will produce people who, quote, know no rule of conduct but human happiness, who will be ambitious only to scourge vice and add and to add dignity and virtue to their country. And beside beside this section in the margin, he in 1838 wrote, Charming Dreams. Of course, in writing about America as a meritocracy in 1783, he was clearly thinking specifically of the country's free citizens. Of course, at this time, slavery was persistent. Connecticut would pass a gradual, aboli gradual abolition law the following year in 1784, but crucially, that law did not emancipate anyone immediately um, and did not emancipate anyone who was currently enslaved in 1784. It, said that people who were born enslaved after the passage of the law would then be freed uh, at age 25. And so it was it was a you know an attempt to gradually um, eliminate the practice of slavery in Connecticut. And it applied specifically to people born in slavery in Connecticut. Slavery was one of many topics that uh, sort of of his day that Webster wrote about. In this 1793 pamphlet, The Effects of Slavery on Morals and Industry, he makes an economic and societal argument against slavery. His goal in this pamphlet, he explains, is not to convince readers that slavery is inhumane and evil. Um, that should be already understood, but to demonstrate that it is in everyone's best interest to end slavery. 
He makes the argument that slavery is degrading both to the enslaved and to the enslaver, and that a country with, without slavery is a more productive and economically prosperous one. This pamphlet was an adaptation of a speech that he gave as a member of the Connecticut Society for the Promotion of Freedom, which was a fairly short-lived uh, anti-slavery organization in Connecticut. And um, one thing that that, that group um, did in, in their work in their time as an organization was in response to the gradual abolition law, working to ensure that the birth dates of people born enslaved in Connecticut were recorded so that they could be uh, freed upon turning 25 in accordance with the law. And like many other white opponents of slavery at this time, Webster was not supportive of immediate emancipation, but rather a gradual, uh, a gradual abolition of slavery as had been undertaken in Connecticut. And he remained consistent in this view over time, over the course of his life. Um, later in his life, as the abolitionist movement grew in the United States and focused on immediate liberation, Webster was strongly opposed, as we can see in this letter that he wrote in 1837 uh, to his daughter, Eliza. He wrote in this letter that the abolitionists are pursuing a course which, if not checked, will or may drench this country with blood. They are absolutely deranged. And he talks about the, the abolitionists um, that to come to the North to preach and then disturb our peace when we can legally do nothing to affect their object is highly is in my view highly criminal and the preachers of abolition of abolitionism deserve the penitentiary so these two documents together um that were written about 50 years apart and we present together as part of the the dictionary day uh open house display offer insights into webster's lifelong opposition to slavery but also conservative view on abolition Returning now to the 1780s, um, as I mentioned before, at, when Webster was at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia um, in 1787, he met his future wife, Rebecca Greenleaf. Um, she uh, did not live in Philadelphia, but was there um, just visiting, and they uh, met and began a correspondence following that. So we, we have a number of really wide-ranging letters written by Webster to Rebecca Greenleaf uh, shortly after they met and well into their marriage. He, in these letters that he wrote from the Constitutional Convention in 1787, he expresses his affection for Becca, as he called her, shares news from the convention, talks about feelings of depression and alienation, um, discusses mutual acquaintances, and at one point even um, seeks her advice on his hairstyle. So these letters provide some insight into Webster's personal and emotional life in a way that, that we don't see in um, his published works. And it also sheds some light on the, the relationship that the couple shared. It was also in the 1780s that Webster published what would become one of the most ubiquitous publications in the United States and remain so uh, through the 19th century. His Grammatical Institute of the English Language, which was a, a three-part textbook um, for children, taught millions of American children to read and write. In some of the copies that we have in our collections, you see notes from the children who use the books, um, like these on the right. The one on the bottom says, steal not this book for fear of shame. Um, and so you get a sense of the way that uh, this work by Webster was very much a part of the everyday life and experience of people growing up in this time and, and was so for uh, quite a long time. This series was transformational in that it helped standardize American language education and American English language and standardized uh, spelling and grammar in a way that had not been done before. 
For Webster, this was part of a larger goal of establishing a standard and distinctive American English language. Back in the 1780s, he advocated for a national language, um, seeing it as something that was part of building the identity of the new country. By the time he published the American English Dictionary in 1828, he was talking about his vision more as one of documenting and codifying the distinct American version of English, um, setting it apart from English as spoken and written in England. Webster is famously responsible for cementing the standard American spelling of many words, like color without the U, um, defense with a S instead of an, a C, many other words that uh, we recognize as differences between American and British spelling in English uh, were sort of codified by Webster in his dictionaries and other works. We can even see in that newspaper, uh, the um, Freeman's Chronicle, where he had gone back to make annotations, he also made some corrections to his own spelling, removing the U from clamors, honor, and valor, and, and many other words. Um, and so you can see where you know he uh, went back to uh, make those corrections based on what he had what he had codified in his own work. Some of these spelling changes that he proposed uh, and put forth in his dictionaries have not become standard. So a few examples that you'll see in the 1806 and 1828 dictionaries are tongue, spelled T-U-N-G, porpoise, P-O-R-P-E-S-S, -E um, ache, uh, I, I swapped those around, ache spelled A-K-E, and steady, S-T-E-D-D-Y. So these kind of simplified, more phonetic spellings of these words um, that did not take off, uh, whereas the other ones did, and you know have not entered standard American English as the others. Some of his um, views on American English and on spelling reform were quite controversial in, in his time and he found himself the subject of significant backlash. This uh, on the right is a parody of Webster's spelling reform um, published shortly after his first dictionary was released in 1806. So you see that the, the writer has presented Webster's American English as overly simplified and phonetic and you know, clearly inferior to the standard uh, British English. Excuse me. As I said earlier, Webster's work on compiling uh, his dictionaries, the um, shorter uh, dictionary in 1806, as well as the um, American Dictionary of the English Language in 1828, happened over the course of many years. And he also didn't do it alone. In addition to the support of his wife, Rebecca, and other members of his family, he had multiple collaborators. And this is, this is one example here. These notes are definitions that were uh, researched and drafted by Webster collaborators, Benjamin Silliman, a Yale science professor, and James Gates Percival, who was a renowned poet as well as a, a geologist and um, conducted the first geological survey of the state of Connecticut. Both of them contributed scientific definitions and Percival also advised on a number of other topics. Um, these were both uh, Yale alumni, as was Noah Webster, and both Silliman and Percival lived in New Haven as well. Percival and Webster uh, had a very contentious working relationship and working on the, the 1828 dictionary and Percival eventually quit the project and went uncredited uh, for his work. When Webster's 1828 dictionary was published, it was printed here in New Haven by Hezekiah Howe. This is a receipt for the purchase of the 1828 dictionary um, purchased in September of 1829. 
um, and it's bound in the front of the dictionary itself. So the, the receipt for the dictionary is bound in the covers of the dictionary that was purchased. And it speaks to sort of the way people would have encountered the dictionary around the time that it was released, uh, as well as the expense of it. We see here that it was, you know, for this copy, which was two volumes, custom bound was $20, which would be a, a very large amount of money in uh, 1829. We also have uh, Hezekiah Howe's ledgers from his shop, uh, which are a, a rich source uh, for so many reasons. But we see purchases of the dictionary in the years after it was released, as well as other works by Webster. We also see purchases by Noah Webster of books from Howe's shop. And we see um, what other people were reading at the same time that they were encountering the dictionary and uh, sort of how it fits into the, the larger literary scene and, and um, culture of New Haven uh, in, at the time that it was released. And it really also underscores that the story of Webster's dictionary, the story of Noah Webster and the Webster family, um, all of it is very much a New Haven story that it is intertwined with the networks that he was part of um, while living in New Haven, the people who collaborated with him uh, and were part of his world. And we also see the way that people in New Haven um, responded to, uh, to his work and it became very much a, a part of their everyday lives as it did for uh, millions of other Americans. So if you are in New Haven uh, or would like to be in New Haven uh, and would like to see these items and many, many more related to Noah Webster, the Webster family, New Haven and their time and the, the history of language education and dictionaries, we hope you'll join us for our Dictionary Day events this year. On October 19th, on Saturday in the afternoon at the New Haven Museum, the museum will be presenting a, co a collection of items from their collections related to these topics. And then the following day, Sunday, October 20th, we'll be hosting our open house here at the Beinecke um, with a selection of materials from our collections, including those you saw today. And we're excited this year that we are joined by colleagues from the Noah Webster House and West Hartford Historical Society. That's the birthplace of Noah Webster. Um, and they will also be sharing some materials from their collections and information about the resources that they have um, uh, at their organization. So I hope that if you are around, um, it should be a, a really interesting event and we would love to see you there. Thank you.